Uh, good afternoon. I'm here with Thomas Poge. He's a Leitner Professor of Political Philosophy at Yale and also for the Center of Mind and Nature at Oslo. He also works at Australia CAP for Ethics in Australia. Uh, welcome, Thomas. Uh, good to see you again. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to just uh, talk to you a little bit about your background um, and say, for example, some of the underlying principles of justice. Um, can you make some comments, say, for example, on the two main principles? Yeah, uh, what you suggested there was that I talk a little bit about John Rawls's view and in particular about the difference principle and the original position idea. Is that right? Yes. Good. So the difference principle is maybe the easiest one to explain. Uh, we basically think of societies as being arranged through basic rules and practices, uh, social institutions, as Rawls often says, and he also uses the idea of a basic structure. Now, societies can be organized in different ways, and these different ways of organizing a society have distributive effects. And that means that depending on how your society is organized, you will have a different distribution of income. Uh, a very natural example for that is a tax system. You can make the tax system very progressive so that the people who have larger incomes pay higher taxes and the people who have lower incomes pay no taxes at all or very low taxes, low percentage. Or you can have a tax system where everybody pays more or less at the same rate, mm -hmm. in which case the net income of people will tend to be more unequal. So there's obviously often a dispute within a society about how the system, the economic system, should be structured, whether inequalities should be larger or smaller, and Rawls proposes a principle for settling these disputes. He is proposing the difference principle, which says that we should arrange the structure of our socioeconomic institutions in such a way that the lowest position is as high as possible. So those people who have the lowest net income in dollars per hour, for example, should have as high a net income as possible. The basic idea behind that is that if you allow no inequality at all, then people will not work very hard because they know in advance that they will get an equal share of the social product and so the social product will be rather small. On the other hand, if you make inequalities very large, then those at the bottom will also have rather, large, rather small incomes, net incomes. And so you find a place in the middle between very large inequalities and no inequalities at all. And you find in particular that place in the middle where the income, the lowest net income, is maximized. And that's a matter for empirical investigation. So economists and practitioners will tinker with the tax system and with other parameters of the economic order until they got it right, until they have maximized the lowest socioeconomic position. That is Rawls's normative proposal. That is what policymakers should aim for. So that's the difference principle. Now let's talk about the original position, which is another idea of Rawls. And the original position is his answer to the question of what justifies something like the difference principle. How can we justify it? If you run a society according to the difference principle, then the rich people will say, why don't we have more inequalities so that we, who work very hard and are very talented, have an even more advantageous position. And some poor people may say, look, we have the highest possible position for the worst off, but we would actually prefer to have less inequality, even if this means that we also have a little less income. 
So the difference principle is not the only principle according to which you can organize your society. <clears throat> and so Rawls is proposing that we should think about which principle to choose by placing ourselves hypothetically in a position where we imagine that we don't know who we are and meet before the society gets going mm -hmm. to debate about what the right principle of justice is. So he constructs this thought experiment of an original position where citizens come together beforehand but without any knowledge about who is who. So when I imagine myself in the original position, I imagine myself not knowing what my gender is. Am I a man or a woman? Am I smart or am I not so well endowed? Am I tall or short? Am I good looking or homely looking? Am I a kind of melancholic type or am I very cheerful? So all these things about myself, I don't know. I also don't know whether I was born into a family that is relatively rich or relatively poor, and so on and so forth. So I really know nothing about myself. And Rawls says, what would you decide about the appropriate principle that should determine the structure of your econo economy, of your society, if you didn't know all this information? And his answer is that if you made the decision in that sort of hypothetical situation, you would have strong reason to opt for something like the difference principle, the difference principle which would uh, protect those at the bottom quite well, because it demands that the net income per hour, let's say, of people in the bottom position should be at, as large as possible. These two principles have been uh, revolutionary in the political philosophy over the last hundred years. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the principles were really formally introduced in their final form in 1970. So that's about 42 years ago. Okay. And uh, they have had an enormous impact. They've created a great deal of discussion in philosophy, but also in economics and in the law in particular. But I would also say that it's fair that these principles have not really had a great deal of influence in the political arena. So, yeah, uh, can you talk a little bit? Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Because the uh, inequality in the United States is quite high right now. Yes, and uh, when Rawls proposed these principles, that was in a period in which the United States, uh, the the public sentiment, the public mood was as uh, far to the left as it has ever been, basically, mm -hmm. or it's been for a long, long time. And that was in connection with the Vietnam War and the student movement. So Rawls's ideas at that time uh, fit the mood of the country. But after Rawls's publication, the country moved once again quite dramatically to the right. Uh, that move uh, dramatically began in 1978 when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and uh, also shot down an airliner over Korea, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Ronald Reagan was elected president and he had uh, free market principles. He did not mind large inequalities at all. And it's fair to say that ever since, in those 30 plus years, uh, the United States shifted to the right and today for most of the people in the United States the difference principle would appear to be a very left-wing uh, principle that is far too friendly to the people at the bottom of the economic hierarchy. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it's pretty easy to see the inequality, you know, uh, but if, if we were to have just a standardized society with everyone with equal liberty, equal wealth, and all of that, I think that would be, be a problem because uh, we want the most talented to be the brain surgeons. And to, to train a brain surgeon, it takes a lot of money. So that there's going to be some inequalities within the system to train highly specialized people, for instance. Mm -hmm. So this is what... Yeah. Yes. 
Now, uh, the training, the cost of training, uh, you could, uh, of course, subtract from a person's income. You could say that when we look at inequalities in income, uh, we cannot, we should not really count the high salary that a surgeon is collecting without subtracting from that high salary the cost that the same person had to pay to get trained. So if this person had to take out a big bank loan in order to go to medical school and then is paying off for the rest of his life or for the next 20 years the high cost of training, uh, we should count his income as the income that's left after the person has paid uh, the annual interest and repayment. But you're certainly right that even apart from covering the cost of training, we do want a certain differentiation in salaries. And that has two reasons. One reason is that we want people to go into the positions for which they are most suitable. So people have positions that they like, things that they like to do, and then there are things that they're good at doing. And society is much better off if I do the job that I'm really good at doing than if I do the job that I really enjoy doing. And so for society, it's much better to entice me to go into the job that I'm good at doing because that makes the whole society much more productive. That's right. And society can make it up to me by paying me a higher salary. So at equal salary, let's say I would be much rather a gardener than a professor. But if society pays me extra for being a professor, then my preference will shift and I will be much rather a professor than a gardener.